Today we're going to review the home buying hotspots that are most susceptible to a price or value downturn in a recession. So welcome to Housing Bubble 2.0 News of the Week, or as I like to call it, another episode of As the Housing Market Turns. Today is August the 1st, a brand new month. Closer and closer to housing crash, folks. Closer and closer. Randy Patrick here putting the realism back in real estate because it always needs a dose of realism, right? This video is brought to you, of course, by our friends at foreclosure.com. So if you want to check out the distressed properties that's in your backyard, your neighborhood, your neck of the woods, go to gethousingdata.com. That's gethousingdata.com. That's my affiliate link. You can check out what's going on. Again, we're talking about housing crash and price reductions and all sorts of good stuff right now. So this is the tool that you can use to see what's actually happening in your zip code, your neighborhood, etc. So anyway, get housingdata.com, check it out. So um, interesting enough, today we're actually going to talk uh, a little bit about downturn and who's susceptible. But the point now is that I think I'm trying to make is that everything is sort of advancing quicker. I think it's advancing faster than I had, uh, uh, I guess, originally anticipated. A lot of people I talk to think that the housing market's doing just that. This whole issue with respect to uh, the Fed uh, and, and raising interest rates have really changed the dynamic of the market in a very short period of time. It's kind of put us on that path. And don't forget what the Fed said last month. They planned on resetting the housing market. So when the, your actual Fed or your Federal Reserve government comes out and says, we need to reset the housing market, I think we need to read between the lines or sort of interpret that a little more broader and really sort of understand what they mean by that. So that's why stuff's happening now. A lot more people are interested in moving forward with projects and doing things. I talked about this last video. Um, check this stuff out with me. Reach out to me. I'm going to be doing an email blast and reach out to people right now because this is the time to get in the business. We're moving towards the new, uh, basically all my partnerships, all the people I work with have just said, let's advance the stuff that we thought we'd do in two or three months in the fall, let's do it now. Whether it's stuff like this or you know doing more marketing or getting our hands on pre foreclosure short sale deals, whatever. Everybody is advancing, um, you know where they want to be because the opportunities there. This stuff's included as well too. So anyway, um, heading to this right now, pandemic home buying hot spots with steep price increases most susceptible to housing downturn in a recession. This is a Redfin article came out over the weekend. Uh, and basically, or that it, uh, maybe late last week, Riverside, California, Boise, Phoenix, and Tampa are among the markets where homeowners stand to lose some of the value that they gained over the past couple of years. Still affordable Rust Belt metros like Cleveland and Buffalo are, are most resilient, though I've got some commentary on that. So really, what this boils down to is that they put together a pretty big chart uh, as to what, I guess you say, locations are most susceptible to losing value in the next downturn. Um, the link will be in the information section of the video, but of course they put out their um, heat map. So clearly things that are red, sort of orangey going to the darker red color, those are the people or the locations that are most susceptible. And the stuff that actually is you know, light blue to sort of a darker blue, that's the least susceptible. But as I said, some of the things are talking about least susceptible. Some of those locations have a ton of of pre-foreclosures and foreclosure auctions going on. So it all depends on, again, how calculations are made for whatever point uh, the article is trying to make here. So please keep that in mind. All right. Um, interesting enough, we're talking about Riverside, you know, Boise, Cape Coral. We'll get to that in a second here. Um, you know, there's a whole group of, of, you know, what's most at risk and, of course, the ones that are least at risk. But I think everything's at risk when you actually take a look at this the chart I'm going to show you, as I said, there's locations that do have a lot of default, a lot of things going on that may not, you know, be, you know, in the, in the top tier, but still will have price decreases or still have a lot of pre foreclosures going on. So that's how that that's how that kind of works. So really, it basically is ranked the highest to lowest chance of a housing downturn. So we're going to go through that chart. The methodology they went through uh, 98 metros where their data is sufficient to check stuff out. The ranking combines 10 indicators come up to, to come up with an overall risk score for each metro relative to the other metros in the analysis. The highest possible score is 100, which I guess would lead to you to believe that's the most susceptible to a downturn in a recession. The lowest possible score is a zero. So basically, um, we're taking a look at some of the, the factors here. Um, you know, home price volatility, 
Um, and again, you can read all this stuff in detail. Average debt to income ratio, average home loan to value ratio, labor market shock, percent of homes flipped, how much a housing market's cooling, um, year over year change in domestic migration, people are moving to and from, um, share of second homes, how many metros have second homes, vacation homes type things, year over year price growth, and supply elasticity, a measure of how quickly su housing supply expands, etc. So these are the sort of 10 factors they're using to come up with this sort of you know calculation, this methodology, the scoring system that will basically give us the ranking and we can take a look at these locations. Uh, and by the way, if you're not already a subscriber, if you do me a favor and help my channel grow and hit the subscribe button, I really appreciate that. And for those of you who think you're a subscriber, please could just verify, hit the subscribe button again because I lose subscribers every day. It's the magic of this platform. All right, thank you very much. So let's get into it right now, guys. Um, talking about um, the most susceptible markets that are, uh, I guess you could say, for a downturn. So as we mentioned here, we've got Riverside, okay, and uh, California number one, Boise uh, number two, Cape Coral number three in Florida, Northport, which is just north of Cape Coral across the bay uh, in Florida, uh, Las Vegas, Sacramento, Bakersfield, Phoenix, Tampa, Tucson, San Diego, Jacksonville. All right, let's go to that. That's the, that's, the, that's the first 12. I want to point out some things, too, before we flip over. So obviously the overall score, highest to lowest, so highest meaning most susceptible. Look at the average, uh, average home loan to value ratio. So we can see that a lot of the locations are 80% or greater, which would mean that's less equity in the house. So just realize that uh, that does play a factor as to what's going on. And, um, you know, uh, again, I look at it, you can see that. You'll see a lot of these are, are 80 plus loan to value ratios, which means not much equity. So uh, point being, you know, you, you do a little correction. Next little way, you lose 5 10%. Then you got to, you lose it off the board. Then you got to sell closing cost commissions. Well, you may not have any equity left. So that's why, you know, when you take a look at these numbers, it's like, that's interesting. I know that lots of, you know, other you know, data providers talk about the trillions and trillions of equity that's out there. But a lot of these locations don't have as much equity on average as people think they do. So keep that in mind. All right. We've seen the first little bit there. Next is Stockton, California, Knoxville, Tennessee, Orlando, Charleston, South Carolina, West Palm, Florida, Fresno, California, Raleigh, North Carolina, Oxnard, California, Salt Lake City, Utah. Columbia, South Carolina, Providence, Rhode Island, Atlanta, Georgia, Miami, Florida. Now, that's about your top 24, 25. I want to point out that, you know, seven uh, of the top 25 locations are in Florida. So we see here Orlando, West Palm, uh, and Miami. The other page had Northport, um, you know, uh, Tampa, um, uh Cape Coral and, and something else as well, too. I think Orlando or, or some other place, Jacksonville. So seven out of the first 24, 25 are in Florida. And six out of the next, uh, the first 24, 25 are out of California, which isn't surprising. If we go back, uh, you know, a slide, you saw both Tucson and, and Phoenix in the top 12. Um, you know, you're going to see things like Atlanta. Obviously, Atlanta is a big metro. If no surprises up there. Places like Raleigh, Salt Lake City, Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, I mean, those are higher appreciation areas, so they're going to crash a bit more. But when you actually take a look at the majority of, of what's listed here, a lot of these locations were, you know, part of ground zero of the last housing, uh, you know, bubble and crash and crisis. So uh, when I look at these these things, not a big surprise. Let's take a look at Orlando, 85% average, you know, loan to value, 6.4% homes flip. Um, share of second homes, 8.7%. West Palm, second homes, 12%. So when you start looking look at some of these numbers on a more micro level, you can see that some of these locations are pretty susceptible to changes because of the dynamic, uh, mixed of, of ownership, second homes, loan to value, things like that. So, and again, if obviously if you live near these locations or in the state, you're going to get a feel for what's going on. So this doesn't come as any surprise. This is embedded in the... Um, um, the Redfin article, so I'll have, as I said, I have a link to that as well. But just showing you guys that, you know, the difference, you know, a year ago, six, seven months ago is the fact that we were talking about, or the mainstream media was talking about what locations are going to increase in value. Well, we're still going to see double digit. Who who could be still in the double digit range? Well, now we have a complete 180 degree uh, flip and a lot of the economists, a lot of the, um, you know, you know um, realty tech companies now, a lot of the... Um, 
senior economists and analysts are in the housing market uh, have sort of changed their tune and uh, or now they feel it's safe and to not be criticized and come out and saying yeah we're going to have a, we're in a housing bubble yeah we're going to have a housing crash and a downturn um, you know so this is the situation where we're in let's take a, so you know it's kind of like it's like little little baby steps i guess you could say so you know we weren't able to say and again not not like there's been a complete cancel culture with respect to what's going on on, on real estate but you know it's it's certain words so you know housing bubble people don't like the word bubble so what do they call it an affordability crisis all right so now we're talking about you know we're not calling it you know a potential crash what do we call it well, we're calling it a downturn. So you see, it really boils down to, uh, for me, I, th I just have to laugh because it's all about word selection, I mean, in the narrative. So for me, listen, housing bubble, bubbles pop, all right? Uh, what happens after bubbles pop? It crashes, market crashes, wherever the market is. So that's kind of where we're at. I think we have a bubble and it's going to crash, pop and crash, all right? So, but according to, you know, people who want to say it a little nicer, maybe not, you know, in, in you know, fan the flames or fuel the flames, whatever. So we, you know, we're having a affordability crisis, and we're going to have a downturn. So just so it's how it's however you want to interpret it, or however you want to say it. That's what makes me laugh. So anyway, uh, lots going on here, but these are all locations, and you can see that you know, look, you know, um, couple North Carolina, Virginia Beach, man, look at that loan to value in Virginia Beach, ninety two percent. All right, so there you go. Washington, we got you know, got some Tacoma. All right, L.A. Obviously, L.A. is going to be big time. Detroit, Austin, Portland, Anaheim, uh, Denver, Colorado Springs. You know, pretty pretty big loan to value there. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Even though it's down from the downturn, you know, some of these locations like a Baton Rouge, like a New Orleans, like places in Mississippi, they're still suffering um, from from you know low income demographics and a lot of the you know natural disasters of, of flooding and. And hurricanes over the past few years, and they they and those state two states in particular have a predominantly high number of defaults on average anyway. So they're not really poised to suffer a downturn. They're kind of always, almost like constantly in a downturn. You know, so that's why some of these things you know sound like don't think that you know just because you're lower on the list that you're doing way better. Um, obviously, you got another Greenville, South Carolina. We got Winston Salem, North Carolina. So these are all locations that grew pretty fast. Um, Greensboro, uh, a lot of that part of the South to the South Carolinas, North Carolinas, a lot of that was, you know, it was growth because people, you know, were able to relocate to these locations that had better priced uh, properties a couple of years ago. And now they've had, you know, a big increase. That's why they're sort of, you know, sort of teetering on that, on that susceptibility scale there. Uh, Grand Rapids, Warren, Michigan, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Lauderdale. So, example, Lauderdale, 82% home loan to value, 7.5% share of second homes. I know because I look at this on a daily basis, the Fort Lauderdale area has a ton of pre-foreclosures. It's one of the largest locations uh, in the in the state for foreclosure filings and auctions and across the country. So, there you go. Uh, again, Nashville's up there. Nashville, which was like the, the jewel, you know, of the, the sort of, you know, north, south uh, you know, up that area. Well, it's going to experience some issues here. Um, you know, look at Allentown, Pennsylvania. Camden, New Jersey, okay? Look at the loan-to-value there, 88%. Um, obviously, not many second homes, but in the New Jersey area, New Jersey is the highest state for foreclosure filings on a per capita basis. So they're going to have their their um, effect. Uh, Houston, even though it's not much information, Houston there, we know Houston, based on its sheer size and footprint, has a ton of pre-foreclosures that are going through every month. Uh, Seattle's picking up. Nassau County, same thing with Nassau County. Um, a lot of people leaving Nassau County uh, in that area of, of New York, New Jersey area. But Nassau County and Suffolk County on Long Island, uh, again, huge number of pre-foreclosures. So it, that's why I'm, you know, they're not they're not higher up for for reasons based on this calculation. But don't think that they're not going to have problems, right? Obviously, as, as I mentioned, New Orleans. San Jose, San Fran, Oakland, obviously that Bay Area, you know, Bay Area has been strong. You can see um, their loan to values are predominantly lower than everybody else's. There's obviously more money there and there's higher equity. Um, but, uh, you know, again, that'll change and they're, they're susceptible as well, too, on big swings. Uh, Richmond, Virginia, Dallas, Oklahoma, Washington, D.C., New Haven, Connecticut. Again, um, you know, look at those locations, New Haven, uh, Burling, Birmingham, Little Rock. Okay, you know, those are all high loan to values. Uh, the whole New Haven, Bridgeport, Connecticut, Hartford, you know, Connecticut, that's always a large area for pre-foreclosures. So they'll get hit up in the Connecticut area, obviously just a little north of, of New York City. 
Uh, Birmingham, you know, is an interesting location. A lot of cheaper homes there, but look at the loan to value. So you can see how this is kind of playing out here. So when, when I'm looking at all these locations, even though their scores are, are lower, we know there's issues. Baltimore, for example, Baltimore scored, you know, 41.9, 86% loan to value. Well, there's a ton of pre-foreclosures in that area of Maryland. And Baltimore's a tougher location. Uh, again, it, it didn't go through the big swing because it didn't appreciate that much, but there will still be a great opportunity to purchase pre-foreclosures, uh, foreclosure auctions, whatever, if you want to work in that in that segment. So there you go on that. Uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut, again, Connecticut's up there with a number of locations. Indianapolis, Worcester, Massachusetts, Kansas, again, Newark, New Jersey. Um, basically, you know what? Um, looking here, Lake County, Illinois. I don't know why, have I missed something in Illinois here? Um, maybe it's not popped up. I'm looking for Cook County or Chicago. I haven't seen that yet. Minneapolis, Wilmington, Delaware. Okay, let's take a look at the next si slide here. Hartford, again, as I mentioned, all that Connecticut stuff. Gary, Indiana, right there on the border, I believe, of um, Illinois and, and uh, in Indiana. New York City, Syracuse, Milwaukee, Omaha, Albany. There's Chicago. Okay, same thing. Now, Chicago has, you know, high loan to value. Uh, obviously, um, very little in, in uh, second home growth. Uh, obviously, lots of domestic migration leaving as well as New York City area. So people are leaving New York. Uh, but again, Chicago will be one, uh, one if not you know, Cook County area, the leaders in pre-foreclosures uh, as time goes on. It could be that right now. Obviously, data is tough to calculate uh, based on how the data companies do it. But you can just see that you know, you know, a lot of these locations that you think, okay, well, because they're lower on the chart that they're stable, well, they're really not. But just it's how it's how this has been portrayed, right? Like, as I mentioned, like a Cleveland, for example, we know that the, you know, the Cleveland has, look at Cleveland down there, 32.4 on the overall score, but we know that Cleveland has, you know, like the top five out of the 10 zip codes for foreclosure uh, activity, all right? It's just, there's areas of Cleveland are very depressed. I've never actually been there, but, you know, if you're looking for short sales and pre-foreclosures, there's a huge opportunity there just because of the size of the city and the, the amount of distress that's going on there. So as, as I mentioned, not all, you know, this is just interesting from their perspective on, you know, we're talking like, again, I think they're, they're really talking about, um, we'll call it metro hotspots. So, so metro hotspots that, you know, people migrated to and, and relocated to because that's what they want to do. So these hotspots showed big increase uh, in home price uh, appreciation over a short period of time. But in the end, um, you know, they're just going to level off and it's going to come back down to norm. And we'll see all the carnage on the pre-foreclosure. So that's sort of the reason why we see that. Uh, those are the ones that are higher up where you got Cleveland, you know, Philadelphia area, the Jersey, New York areas. They're lower because they're not swinging up on the migration, um, you know, home price appreciation due to migration, things like that. They're, they're losing, um, you know, net, netting loss and they're not really having huge home price appreciation. So therefore, you know, again, as I said, uh, they're not swinging up on this chart of this analysis, but we know there's a ton of opportunity there. So as I said, just because your city, your town is not in the top tier, don't think there's no opportunities there. There's tons of opportunities. And that's what I, you know, I always talk about opportunity. So what do I mean by opportunity? Distressed property, sitting there doing nothing, which basically means real estate agents aren't going after them to list. Real estate investors aren't going after them to try to to purchase or fix and flip or, or make them cash cash flow rentals, etc. Airbnbs, whatever. So there's a certain segment of you know, and I say the pre foreclosures because you just can't flip them and do things in less than thirty days. Okay, the process you have to go through on the pre foreclosure stuff. Either you got to you know pay it off and bring it or bring it current, pay it off, reinstate the mortgage, or do a short sale. Uh, that's, that's you know that's the situation we're in. So a little more time is, is required, a little more finessing going on. But because it's not the quick and easy thing to do, most instead most agents, most real estate investors ignore this market. Thus, when I say the opportunities, there really is the opportunities. I can pretty much tell you anywhere in the country what the opportunities are uh, and the reason why you should be doing it. I live here in Florida, so obviously you know as I said, you got you know seven out of the top 24, 25 are poised to have a big downturn, and I know that what the foreclosure or pre-foreclosure volume is behind the scenes, like the shadow inventory, to eat, to further even um, make that more difficult and have a bigger downturn as that gets kind of released and we start working through that. We're not, and again, we're not even at the tip of the iceberg, folks, on this foreclosure stuff. That's why it's interesting because we see all this discussion going on, right? 
but they're not even including that segment right now because it's just a non-topic, a non-starter. They just the media and the, and the writers of journalists have chosen just not to include it in their stats or in their discussion points. So there you go. So anyway, guys, that's a scoop on that. Um, as I mentioned, lots going on. So why do I keep showing this? It's time. Get involved. Get in the marketplace. All right. Contact me about this next stuff here. Okay. I will show you how to do it. Limited time. Um, for the, the short sale cash connection. It's going away. We're going to have a bunch of broader foreclosure fortunes coming out in the next couple of weeks. So limited time to get on. Jump on with it now. Yeah, you'll get access to the foreclosure fortune things, of course, but I'm phasing that out. We have a different program we're running now. It's going to be whole. It'll be different. More bang for buck now uh, as opposed to in the near future. So anyway, guys, uh, once I always say that this, but I do appreciate um, the views, likes, comments. Please share the video with your family and friends. Subscribe to our subscriber. That's how to get a hold of me. And we look forward to speaking with you in a couple of days. Take care.